You already know what this is, right? You know what it does, because Nintendo nailed the advertising for it. Just look at how well it's selling. A few million here, a few million there, and it easily surpassed the Wii U's lifetime sales. You probably have a rough idea of what's powering it, that being Nvidia's Tegra X1. So I'll examine the chip, as well as recap Nvidia's history with consoles. And lastly, I'll discuss my thoughts on the Switch, and a few of its games. Enjoy! Microsoft's bold leap into the console scene, the Xbox, was powered by the NV2A. This GPU was co-developed by both Microsoft and Nvidia, and featured four pixel pipelines which each had two texture units, clocked at 233 MHz. In terms of PC equivalency, the NV2A's performance is somewhere between a GeForce 3 series GPU and a GeForce 4 series GPU. It was this, along with the cut-down Pentium 3 and 64MB of DDR-SD RAM that made the Xbox the most powerful console of the 6th generation. And this helped it bolster a library of impressive looking games. They even managed to cram Half-Life 2 onto it, which is an impressive feat for optimization, despite the not so great frame rate. And so, the Xbox went on to sell 24 million units, making it the second best selling console of the generation. The PlayStation 3 originally wasn't going to have a GPU. Sony planned to release it in 2005, with only the cell processor and apparently half the RAM. This changed towards the end of development, when Sony and Nvidia co-developed the RSX Reality Synthesizer, which was based on the 7800 GTX. It featured 24 pixel shader units, 8 vertex shader units, 24 TF units, 8 ROPs, and a core clock of 500 MHz. Along with all those, the RSX is 256MB of GDDR3 RAM, clocked at 650MHz. This GPU is a little tacked on, as it was a last minute addition, but it works well enough in tandem with the cell processor and is able to output some truly stunning visuals. Most of Naughty Dog's titles come to mind, especially The Last of Us. While the PS3 was initially bogged down by its high price, eventually Sony began to break even and it caught up to the Xbox 360 sale-wise, meaning that the PlayStation 3 was still a success. And then, the Switch. First off, what the hell were Nintendo thinking when they decided to use outdated tech which was beaten by smartphones from 2015 onwards? Well, to answer that question, we first need to look at the specs. The heart of the Switch is a cut-down Nvidia Tegra X1, with 4 ARM A57 cores at 1GHz, it's about half as fast as a Galaxy S6. Accompanying our somewhat weak processor are 256 NVIDIA Maxwell CUDA cores, undocked at a clock speed between 307 and 384 MHz, they are roughly equivalent to 1 tenth of a GTX 950. Docked at 768 MHz, they are almost equivalent to 1 fifth. The Switch also features an underwhelming 4GB of LPDDR4 RAM and 32GB of internal flash storage. With these specs, the Switch should be an outdated trashy tablet, but Nintendo aren't stupid. Well, maybe a little. They went with the Tegra X1 because it's easy to port games to, unlike the Wii U. And let's not forget some of the excellent optimization being done for the Switch. The folks over at Panic Button managed to cram Doom 2016 onto it. Considering the specs, this is an impressive feat. Yes, it doesn't look nearly as good as the other console versions, but it has an almost stable 30fps, and it's portable. That's the main draw of the Switch, taking your games on the go. From my experience, it works really well, but as with most Nintendo consoles, there are some downsides that need to be addressed, and I'm far from the first one to notice these shortcomings. One of these is the Switch's poor battery life, which only lasts for around 3 hours in games such as Zelda and Mario. If you're planning on taking your Switch on a long flight or drive, a battery bank is a necessity. Considering that this is meant to be a portable, such a short battery life is quite a letdown. Another is its 32GB of storage. In some cases, it isn't even enough for one digital game. 
Even some physical games that come on the Switch as minuscule cartridges require massive downloads that eat away at the Switch's tiny storage space. Compared to the other two console competitors, it's just pathetic. Basically, expanding your storage is a must. Just make sure to avoid the overpriced Nintendo licensed SD cards. For controls, the Switch comes with a pair of Joy-Cons, which can be used to offer normal controller functionality or individually for local multiplayer. 3D Rumble is nice, and the Joy-Cons, while small, feel okay in your hands, if not a little awkward. They don't feel too loose when attached to the Switch, and come off easily. But of course, the Switch is a hybrid console, all thanks to this poorly built dock. Now, I've already talked about what the dock does to improve performance, but what else does it do? Thanks to the overclock, the Switch has the extra power it needs to render games at higher resolutions or better graphical settings. But in certain, much more intensive games like Doom, no big changes are made, other than maybe stabilizing the frame rate a bit to prevent dips. The dock is a handy device, but with a hefty price tag and a poorly built plastic frame, it's a shame that there are no viable alternatives. All three of these games I have here are simply fantastic. They excel at visuals and gameplay, but who are they best suited for? I'll start with Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. This is probably the best iteration of Mario Kart to date. As expected from a modern Nintendo game, the controls are tight, the visuals are stunning, the trucks are super fun, and the soundtrack is outstanding. An assist mode is a welcome addition, and helps new players keep up with more experienced ones. The option to use motion control is nice, but not too practical, especially in handheld mode. If you're looking for a game to take advantage of the dual Joy-Cons for some quick casual multiplayer fun, this is the game for you. However, if you're after an expansive single player experience, the next two titles will be better suited for you. Mario Odyssey is pretty damn good. Definitely not a masterpiece, but pure fun nonetheless. The silky 60fps makes it a joy to control, and this is helped by the game featuring the best Mario moveset to date. Cappy is by far the best companion of the, all the 3D Mario games, and his addition adds so much more flexibility. The capture mechanic is cool, but not really expanded on that much. While this game is full of a lot of great stuff, there is also a lot of tedium and elements are repeated a lot, to varying amounts of success and quality. Overall, this game really suits the pick up and play nature of the Switch, as it only takes a short amount of time to complete a small challenge or hunt down a moon. If you're seeking a game of this nature, Odyssey is for you. Breath of the Wild is a spectacular open world game, just filled to the brim with things to fight, explore, and collect. It's quite a visual spectacle too. The cell shaded graphics blend surprisingly nicely with the semi realistic stylized landscapes, and as with most Nintendo titles, the colours pop nicely. Combat is a little simplistic, but is still engaging, and fits nicely along with other elements in general gameplay. Exploration is where this game shines. It's quite intriguing to traverse a new area for the first time, especially when you spot something that you've never seen before, off in the distance. This game is definitely better for longer play sessions, and being able to take this massive, explorable world wherever you go is quite something. The Nintendo Switch shouldn't work. It's basically a cut down, underclocked Nvidia Shield with a couple of multicolored controllers and a USB hub. But because of excellent product design, great marketing, and amazing games, it has become one hell of a console. Before this video ends, I'd like to thank my sister for doing some of the camera work, and also the obsoletist for assisting with research and writing and Cindery Lemons for giving some feedback and generally being motivational, as well as a few others from the Obsoletus Discord. And finally, thanks for watching.